We are so honored, truly, tonight to have Ambassador David Friedman with us in the house. Ambassador Friedman's exemplary leadership helped shape history with the movement of the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem, the declaration of Golan Heights as sovereignty of the nation of Israel. Under Ambassador Friedman's leadership, the Trump administration has done more for Israel than any other administration in the history of America. He was among a small group of American officials responsible for the Abrahamic Accords, peace and normalization between Israel, UAE, Bahrain, Sudan, and Morocco, for which he was nominated with the Nobel Peace Prize in 2021. I remember the times that we would speak I could not keep up with Ambassador Friedman going from one level to another level in support of Israel. He has been recognized as one of the 50 most influential Jews in the world. He came in number two in 2019 and tied for first place in 2020. Ambassador Friedman was honored by President Trump with the National Security of Medal in September 2020. Let us welcome Ambassador David Friedman. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. Well, it's so great to be here. The warm feelings you have, the, uh, the commitment you have, and, and really most importantly, the prayers that you have for the state of Israel are so important. Every, every democracy reflects the will of its people. And as, as communities like this, outstanding communities like this, show their support for Israel, it does resonate and it does make Israel a safer, more prosperous, more secure place. So thank, thank all of you. Really deeply appreciate it. My thanks to, uh, to my friend Rabbi Ephraim Goldberg, who has built such a really magnificent synagogue and community within Boca Raton. You know, I'm from New York, I'm sure some of you are as well, and I'm sure, I can't imagine any of you are regretting your decision to move down here. We're, we're certainly not. You know, uh, New York is the, uh, is the second largest Jewish community in the world. I mean, just think about it. it. New York all by itself is the second largest community in the world after Israel. Now, that's, that's good. There's certain good things about that. But, you know, where I lived, you know, every time I leave home and come back, there was another shul. Every, 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 six, every six, seven weeks, there was another shul. And I guess there's something to be said for that. Um, there's also something to be said for a community in which literally every single person I met here, I didn't know anybody in Boca Raton until about a few months ago when, when two of our kids moved to Boca Raton, the smartest thing either one of them ever did. So we have six grandchildren here, and you know, we, so we come now more often, and what, what an incredible community. You know, everyone I speak to, it's, first of all, everybody here, no matter what shul they go to, they love their rabbi. It's, it's an unbelievable thing that everybody loves their rabbi. If you, don't, if you don't think that's a big deal, you're, you're missing it because that is so special about this community. When I walked in I, and I saw this, uh, this screen behind me, I got it right away. This is it. Ki'ishachad, Belevachad. Now that's the famous um, Rashi. Uh, when, uh, when the Jewish people were camping out at Mount Sinai waiting for the Torah to come, it says, Vayichan Sham Yisrael Neged Ahar. The, the Jewish people camped out. Now it says it, Vayichan, not Vayachanu. It says they camped in the singular. And Rashi says, well, at that moment, at Mount Sinai, even though there were hundreds of thousands of people, they were like one person with one heart. As much as any community can lay claim to that, being one person with one heart, it's, uh, it's here in Boca Raton. So again, call a to all of you. It's so beautiful. And I want to thank my, my, my friend, uh, Pastor Mario, all his work that he's done for the Latino Council for Israel. Uh, Mario, uh, along with Rabbi Goldberg, both of them were with me uh, when we opened up our embassy in Jerusalem in May of 2018. I, Mario and I go back to 2016 when he introduced me to, uh, to a number of his colleagues. Uh, until that point, I, I, I knew nothing about the uh, evangelical community, uh, really nothing. And, and, and Pastor Mario and some others made, made my acquaintance as I was then advising candidate, candidate John, Donald Trump on Israel. He introduced me to a distinguished, a distinguished group of ministers representing millions of parishioners with a deep and unconditional love for Israel. Uh, I, I was actually floored. People with, uh, I, I think the key word really is just unconditional. People with just a love of Israel. Millions of people. And, and I said to myself, this is, you know, 
I'm used to, you know, th the Jewish community, there, there, there are 50 million of us in the whole world. You know, we had, we had 18 million in 1941. We dropped down to 12 after the Holocaust. And we've only come about halfway back. I mean, even now, there's only about 50 million Jews. And so the idea that there were 50, 70, 80, 100 million Christians just in the United States alone, let alone South America and all throughout the world, for whom they truly believe that God will bless those who bless Israel. And they live that life every day. I saw something very special. And then Pastor Mary and I got to work on the uh, Israel platform at the Republican National Convention in 2016. You know, platforms generally are aspirational, but, but this one, it was, it was really meaningful because it set the stage for the next four years. The, the Republican platform for Israel in 2016 is the most pro-Israel platform written by any party ever. And, and you know, the, the, the policies that we were able to implement, uh, the support we got from millions and millions of uh, evangelical Christians led by Pastor Mario and so many others, it, it, it made a big difference, it really did. So thank you. Let me just say one more thing before I just kind of get into the substance of, of what I want to talk about. This is a, uh, this is an Orthodox synagogue, uh, but not everybody here is Orthodox, not everybody here is even Jewish. Uh, we're here as a diverse community of Jews and Christians, all united by our unconditional love and support for the state of Israel. Theologically, we're, we walked into this room in different places, and I have no doubt we're going to walk out of this room no, uh, no different in different theological places. But we will all be strengthened by our common belief in the, in the sanctity and the importance and the holiness of the state of Israel. And as we say, I assume we say in the synagogue, I don't want to be presumptuous, but on my guess we probably do, that um, Israel is the reshit smichat gulotenu. Do we say that? We do, right? I know that, yeah. Okay. Israel is for all of us, the beginning of, of the redemption of the world, and, and God willing, that, that process will, will continue. In a world in which unity uh, behind the Jewish state is so, so hard to find, we need to celebrate that unity tonight and to see it for the blessing that it truly is. So welcome all of us, no matter, no matter where you came from, no matter what you, what, uh, you know, where, what, which pew you sit in, Thank you all for being here, and it's, it's deeply important. So one of the most common forms of anti-Semitism in America is the accusation that Jews have dual loyalty, that they somehow support Israel more than America. Uh, in the four years that I was the uh, ambassador to Israel, I was on the receiving end of that terrible canard more than a few times, and oddly enough, even uh, probably more often actually by by groups of Jewish Americans uh, than others. Uh, and it's shameful, and it's nonsense. And not only does support for Israel by American Jews not compromise or undermine support by Jewish Americans of their host country, support for Israel is actually a quintessential American value, and I'm gonna get a little deeper into that. I'm standing here in the presence, right behind me, are, I'm sure, some very, very beautiful, holy, Torah scrolls. The Torah, as you all know, represents the five books of Moses, the first and most sacred part of the Bible. I think the Bible is God's gift to humanity. It is the formula for how to lead a just, fulfilling, and meaningful life. And by many accounts, certainly by my account, it is the most important written work of all time. Now, what's in second place? Now, we, could, we could debate that all night, and we're not going to. But I'm going to make a suggestion as to the second most significant, at least in my mind, written work that is known to man. And I'm, gonna, I'm, excluding the rest, I'm, I'm excluding the rest of the Bible, so we'll put the Bible all in one bucket and now look for second place. I think the second most significant document ever written was the United States Declaration of Independence. Let me tell you why. Because that brilliant document fundamentally changed the way in which we think about the relationship between a government and its citizens. The Declaration of Independence provided every human being was created equal and endowed by their creator. Remember those words, endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. You all know what they are, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. The notion that essential human rights came from God and not from man was a revolutionary concept. It made those rights permanent, made them undeniable, made them non-negotiable, and 
Ideally, it made them immune from the vagaries of politics. Now, how did our founding fathers, how did they know which rights were considered to be unalienable? How did they know what God considered to be the critical unalienable rights? Remember, the Declaration of Independence doesn't say these are important rights or valuable rights. The Declaration of Independence says these rights were ordained by God. Well, our founding fathers knew that because they read the Bible. There is no question that the American Republic was sculpted from the lessons of the Bible. Not surprisingly, all the unalienable rights identified in the Declaration of Independence, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, find their home in the Bible itself. Let's take a quick look. Start with life. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19. I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life so that you and your children may live a strong endorsement of life you will find nowhere, nowhere else. How about liberty? Leviticus 25.10. You shall sanctify the 50th year and proclaim liberty throughout the land until all the inhabitants thereof. Well, we know this verse was high within the consciousness of our founding fathers because those words adorn the Liberty Bell, which was inscribed about 30 years before the Declaration of Independence. Happiness. So many references in the Bible. Here's one, Deuteronomy chapter 26, verse 11. And you shall be happy in all the good that the Lord your God has given to you in your household, you, the Levite, and the stranger who dwells in your midst. It's all there in the Bible. Undoubtedly, the single strongest influence, probably the only influence, on the drafters of the Declaration of Independence. Many believe, certainly our founding fathers believed, that the word of our Creator, the word of God, is expressed in the Bible. And they read those words and they drafted the Declaration of Independence. Now, from where did the Word of God emerge? From where? What's the geography behind these words that our founding fathers were so focused upon? Well, the answer is very clear. It's in the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah, Yeshayahu Yish in the Jewish faith, all recognized as a prophet in all, all three great monotheistic faiths. Isaiah gives us the answer. He says, out of Zion shall go forth the law, in the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Ki mitzion teitzei Torah udavar Hashem mirushalayim. In this synagogue, those words are said, let's see, twice on Saturday, once on Monday, once on Thursday, Rosh Chodesh, festivals, I mean, it said, it said a lot. And that's it, the word of the Lord comes from Jerusalem. It is irrefutable. Our great American Republic has its roots in Jerusalem. Never forget that. To understand the connection between the birth of our nation and the city of Jerusalem is to understand all that has transpired since between Israel and the United States. It is to understand why the pilgrims risked their lives in the 17th century to reach a new world and establish what they refer to as a new Jerusalem. It is to understand why the United States opened its consulate in Jerusalem in 1844, 104 years before the establishment of the State of Israel, at which point the Consul General went to the Jaffa Gate, planted a flag, and said, the United States hereby extends its protection to the Jews of Jerusalem. It's to understand why Mark Twain and Ulysses Grant visited Jerusalem. President Abraham Lincoln told his wife Mary, upon the conclusion of the Civil War, that he'd like to take some time off and travel to Jerusalem. There are those that say those were the very last words that Lincoln said before his death. It's to understand why President Harry Truman caused the United States to be the first nation to recognize the reborn state of Israel in 1948. It's to understand why in 1995, the United States House of Representatives and the United States Senate, by overwhelming majorities, the kind of majorities you never ever see anymore, recognized Jerusalem as the capital of Israel and mandated that the transfer of our embassy should be made to that city. It's to understand why Every president since President Clinton promised to move our embassy to Jerusalem, or at least to maintain its character as the undivided capital of Israel, although only one president kept that promise. And it is to understand why today the United States Embassy proudly stands in the undivided city of Jerusalem, the eternal capital of the Jewish state. Before leaving office, I officially recognized the city of David in Jerusalem, the place 
where the biblical kings ruled and the biblical prophets preached. I recognize the city of David as an American heritage site because Jerusalem is so essential to the heritage of the United States. Don't ask me if I got approval to do that because I'm not sure. I'm not sure it's legal, but it's, 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 but it's there. It's there. America's physical beginnings may be traced back to Plymouth Rock, to Valley Forge, Continental Congress, the Constitutional Convention, the 4th of July, other important points of historical reference. But America's spiritual beginning, its bedrock foundational principles, its understanding of the God-given rights of every human being, that spiritual beginning occurred in the words of Isaiah, with the Var Hashem Yerushalayim, with the word of the Lord, emerging from Jerusalem. Do Jews betray a dual loyalty when they support Israel? Of course not, God forbid. Jews who support Israel stand for the very best of our American heritage and our American values. America is at its best when it supports Israel. It is a value deeply ingrained in our national DNA. And it is a value that I believe has brought America such blessing and such bounty from the Lord. Many of us today look to our capital in Washington, D.C with confusion, with bewilderment, some with disappointment. Who are we as Americans? What have we become? What do we stand for? Where we used to feel such pride and confidence, we're now left with uncertainty and even emptiness. My friends, the answer to this existential crisis in America is not to become a Republican and it's not to become a Democrat. The answer is to return to the Judeo-Christian values on which America is forced to restore our foundational commitment to life, to liberty, to the pursuit of happiness, and to renew our relationship with HaKadosh Baruch Hu, with the Holy One, blessed be He, as we grow more and more untethered from our values, we grow weaker as a nation. Moses warned us about this. He warned us about this over 3,000 years ago. In De Deuteronomy, 12.8. You are not to do as we are doing here today, with everyone doing whatever seems right in his own eyes. What an apt description of modern times. Everyone doing whatever seems right in their own eyes. We are a blessed nation because we are a nation of laws. We are a nation of values. We are driven by principles, principles of personal responsibility, equality, opportunity, generosity and accountability. When people ask me, what is the greatest risk to the U.S.-Israel relationship? They say, is it this or that politician, or is it this or that policy? And my answer is that the greatest risk to the U.S.-Israel relationship is that America no longer leads the world, whether because it no longer wishes to lead, or because it no longer possesses the moral authority to do so. When we surrendered to the Taliban in Afghanistan, leaving behind our allies, our partners, and even our citizens, we lost part of our moral authority. When we tell Vladimir Putin in advance that the United States will offer no military resistance or interference in his threatened takeover of Ukraine, we lose a part of our moral authority. When the United States does business as usual with China and continues to ignore the fact that over one million Muslim Uyghurs are being held in concentration camps, we lose a part of our moral authority. When the United States lifts economic sanctions on Iran as the greatest state sponsor of terrorism continues its assault on innocent lives, we lose a part of our moral authority. Do we care about U.S. policy on Jerusalem, the Golan Heights, Judea and Samaria, the Palestinians? Of course we do. But first and foremost, we care that America retain its credibility as a force for good in the world. And to retain that credibility, we need to go back to the basics of our Judeo-Christian values that made us the greatest nation on earth, so well equipped to fulfill God's work. I mentioned earlier about a million Muslims in concentration camps in China. It's a horrible thing and it brings up terrible memories of the unconscionable acts of anti-Semitism that have been taken against the Jewish people. We say never again. Never again will Jews be rounded up and led to their destruction. I believe that we mean it when we say it. 
What exactly do we mean? Who said, who's saying never again now when it comes to the persecution of a million Muslims in China? Who said never again to protect three million uh, Cambodians from Pol Pot? Or 11 million Russians killed uh, by Stalin? Or a million Tutsis killed in Rwanda genocide? Did anyone say never again? Did that work? Did that work out in any of those places? Did anyone say never again when Bashar Assad started gassing his own people? We say never again, but what does it mean in so far as genocides have continued since the Holocaust? My friends, never again is an important mantra, but for the Jewish people, never again means nothing in the absence of the state of Israel. It is Israel, and it is only Israel, that stands as a guarantor of Jewish survival in a world that is increasingly inhospitable to the Jewish people. It was Israel that rescued Jews from Ethiopia, from the Sudan, from the Soviet Union, and from the tarmac in Entebbe, and elsewhere, wherever Jews are in peril. I'll tell you a story. A few years ago, President Trump was, uh, was in the UK with then Prime Minister Theresa May, and she told him that there was a humanitarian group in Syria, they're called the White Helmets, and they uh, were just about to be slaughtered by, the, uh, by Assad's army that was approaching. And she said, you know, we work a lot with these, this humanitarian group, and the only nation that can save them is Israel. And the president said to her, don't worry, I'll get Friedman on it right away. <laughs> Thanks a lot. So what followed was a sleepless week of working on a rescue plan. Israel really had no interest in doing this. They were, the last thing they wanted to do was to enter Syria in the middle of a civil war. They'd been out of the war. The Syrians were fighting each other, they weren't fighting Israel, and all of a sudden Israel was being asked to enter Syria and to save 400 humanitarian workers, all of whom, by the way, or I should say none of them, had a nice word to say about Israel. These were not Israel's friends, and Israel's being asked to save these 400 humanitarian workers. They did it, at great personal risk. They, they, they saved 400 Muslim humanitarian workers, because that's what Israel does. So every now and then someone comes to me and says, you know, I'm not anti-Semitic. I got nothing against Jews. Nothing is a Jewish religion. I'm just opposed to Israel. You know, I don't think there should be a Jewish state. Israel should be a state like all others and treat everybody the same. When you hear that, and you hear it all the time, right? It's not, not an unusual comment. Understand, make no mistake, you're listening to an anti-Semite. An anti-Semite who denies the right of the Jewish people to a single state of their own. Has no qualms about 20 or more countries that are Muslim states, 20 more countries that are Christian states, but there can't be a single Jewish state. You're listening to an anti-Semite who seeks to deny the Jewish people, and only the Jewish people, a means of defense against, God forbid, another Holocaust. An anti-Semite too ignorant to know that Israeli Arabs have one of the highest standards of living in the entire Arab world. And an anti-Semite who denies the centrality of the land of Israel to the Jewish faith. When someone says, I have nothing against the Jews, only against Israel, don't buy it. There is no Judaism without Israel. It is the central tenet of the Jewish faith. The greatest commentator in the Bible, Rabbi Shlomo ben Yitzhak, Rashi, he, uh, his very first comment on the Bible in the creation story, the Sefer Brishit, he asks a question, why does the Bible begin with the story of creation? After all, the Jewish people are people that keep 613 commandments. The first commandment doesn't arise until the book of Exodus, the commandment of observing the new moon. Rosh Chodesh. So why waste everybody's time with the story of creation? It has nothing to do with any of the commandments. And Rashi answers the question as follows. He says, and remember, this is in the 11th century. This is over a thousand years ago. He says that the nations of the world will challenge the rights of the Jewish people to their promised land. And Rashi says that the way to respond to those nations, those nations who would deny the Jews the right to Israel, is to say to them, wait a minute, God created the world. God created the world, and he can convey any part of it to whoever he wants, and God conveyed the land of Israel to the Jewish people. To Rashi, the story of the whole reason for the story of creation, the whole story about, you know, the seven days of creation, and it's all about one thing. It's title insurance of the Jewish people to their biblical homeland. A thousand years ago, Rashi saw the nations of the world, and we're no different today. So, we can't separate our faith from the land of Israel. Every prayer book, I've, I did this, I, I checked this out of curiosity. I looked at every prayer book of every Jewish stream to see how they dealt with 
I'm familiar with you know with the Orthodox stream where we we say we ask God to return us return us to Jerusalem return us to Zion. I wonder the, every Jewish every Jewish stream the, the Jews pray to return to Zion to return to Jerusalem to return to the land of Israel. And people say, well, you know, you can criticize Israel without being anti-Semitic. Well, yeah, of course you can, but that's not the point. The people who are so-called criticizing Israel, they're not, they're not, you know, even uh, well versed enough to actually criticize policy or politics. Under the guise of criticism, they seek to deny the rights of the Jewish people to have a state of their own. That is anti-Semitism, nothing more, nothing less. So how do we deal with all this? You know, as someone who's been on the front lines of this for the last four or five years, a couple of words of advice, pride in being Jewish. Never apologize for being Jewish. Never make excuses for being Jewish. Don't be less of a Jew to show that you're even-handed or be more accepted within a secular world. First of all, it's not going to work. It's, it's a waste of time anyway. But be proud of who you are. Show no tolerance for anti-Semitism. Show the same indignation that we see expressed by other peoples who suffer discrimination. Don't defend any less our right to be Jews. Now, in my first month in the State Department, I was almost like, you know, like, like the panda in the zoo. Like, I was like an anomaly. People were watching me, you know, like in, there was, in Washington, they had this one panda. Everybody used to watch the panda because there was only one of them. And I was this one, you know, super pro-Israel guy in the State Department. Everybody was, was, was keeping their eye on me and watching me. And after about a month of people kind of watching, somebody came up to me, a senior person came up to me and said to me, a word of advice, don't be so Jewish. Now look, the State Department has tens of thousands of people. Of, of every single ethnic group you can imagine. And they're all working on countries in which they have some, you know, some ethnic association. But the laws of political correctness only apply to everyone but Jews. So anyway, I had her removed from anything that I was working on, and uh, she was never heard from again. But she gave me a good idea. I just, I just reversed it 180 degrees. Instead of telling people, don't be so Jewish, my response was, be Jewish. Follow in the footsteps of over 100 generations of our predecessors who led exemplary meaningful lives. Be Jewish. Continue to pray in the same language, with the same words, in the same place, the land of Israel, as our ancestors did for thousands of years. Be proud of that. And be Jewish whether you're Jewish or not. Be Jewish and bring back the Judeo. See, we're flipping the, people thought you were going to convert me. I'm going to convert you. So. <laughs> whether you're Jewish or not helped to bring back the Judeo-Christian values that made America such a great nation. And live your life, live your lives in a manner reflecting the highest ideals of this ancient faith. And finally, be Jewish by showing hakarat hatov, by showing gratitude to our wonderful friends of different faiths who courageously and selflessly support Israel and the Jewish people, including the Latino Council for Israel, which is co-hosting tonight. Thank you so much. May God bless you. May God bless Israel. May God bless the United States of America.